Joining us is our Chief International Affairs Editor Robert Parsons uh, from Khartoum, Aza Ahmed Abdelaziz with the Peace Research, Research Institute Oslo. Thank you for speaking with us. And from London, we're with uh, Sudanese academic Alam Ahmed, founder of uh, the International Diaspora Project. Uh, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Uh, l let me begin with you, sir. Uh, wh what are, did you ever have hope uh, of a Ramadan uh, cease, an end of Ramadan ceasefire, an Eid ceasefire? No, I never had uh, any hope because of the situation, the distrust between the two military and the rabid forces. And also they didn't take any moral consideration or any care about the civilian of the Sudanese people. Uh, so I didn't have any hope, and uh, I predicted it will be not just fragile, but they will not commit to any one of them. So it's just very ugly situation. It's unfair on the Sudanese people. Every Ramadan, every Eid, this is the third year in a row, they had a very sad Eid. And unfortunately, this is a, a very miserable situation for the Sudanese people. Yeah, in previous years, it was... Uh... Uh, the crackdown on those uh, clamoring for uh, a return to civilian rule. This time, it's an argument between military top brass that's got uh, the whole of the country pinned down. Have you been able uh, to speak to loved ones in the last 24 hours? Yes, we did. And uh, we have been doing that by all means for the last seven days. And uh, the situation is getting worse and, and worse. And I was just describing this yesterday to one of the channels when I called my dad. He's in a 200 kilometer out of Khartoum in a, in, a, in a city called Medani. When I called him two days ago, he was very happy to tell me that our sister who lives in Khartoum, he, she joined, she managed to escape with her kids all the way to Medani. So you can see how happy he is that he managed to get his daughter out of Khartoum. And that's the situation with many, many families Everyone is fleeing Khartoum for the last two days, either like 200 kilometers or even more, or even just 50 or 60 kilometers out of the fighting zone in Khartoum. Robert Parsons, where to turn? Uh, you heard in that uh, report that call by the French Foreign Ministry spokesperson for, uh, for an immediate ceasefire, but where to turn to broker such a deal? Yeah, I mean, this is the difficulty because there are several countries which have got interests in, in Sudan and many countries who appreciate uh, just how it, important it is that this conflict be prevented from spread, spreading because of the geopolitical position of Sudan, its importance in the region, the fact that it's bought, borders seven other countries and the potential for further escalation of violence. Everybody, in other words, recognizes just how important it is to find some way of preventing this conflict from escalating. But trying to find a way to, to bring influence to bear on the, the two parties that are involved in this conflict is the most difficult thing. Uh, and given the fact, too, that you know, interests sometimes cut across traditional alliances, like, for instance, the United States and Egypt you know, have been allied in other respects, but in the, the case of Sudan, uh, sometimes seem to have different interests. The, the Egyptian government was very closely allied, for instance, with General Burhan, not particularly sympathetic to the democratic movement in Sudan, the United States trying to push the democratic agenda. So, so now, I think, is a moment for, for, for the, the various different groups who are interested in the situation in Iran, trying to find some sort of common ground to put pressure on the two parties. But how are you going, go about doing that when they seem so far apart uh, on what they want to happen and appear so determined to pursue their own uh, particular uh, interests. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody is particularly optimistic at the moment that an easy solution is going to be found, even if there is a strong attempt to bring outside pressure to bear. Uh, Alam Ahmed, uh, Hamedi's RSF uh, claims it's open uh, to the idea of a ceasefire. What's your reaction to that? Uh, they can't be trusted. Uh, and I think I can just tell you the, 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 the wording from General Burhan last night when he made that interview with Al Jazeera. He said the rabid support forces have been uh, installing lots of checkpoints within Khartoum, terrorizing people, stopping them, searching them, asking them for ID. So these are not people you can trust them with any ceasefire. Uh, we still don't know why this whole war is started. 
So uh, it is proven now uh, the military doesn't trust them, although they have been saying repeatedly, we welcome any initiative of ceasefire. Uh, you have seen twice it's been it's failed. And uh, I think this is a problem. The victims here are the ordinary Sudanese people. Now they have been stopped and searched. That's why many people are leaving the country. But let me just draw the attention of your viewer to another important aspect here. Uh, the Cuba agreement, which was signed by the transitional government with four military groups who then shared power with the uh, government of Khartoum, those also they have military or, if you like, uh, groups which have uh, um, military apparatus, all of them are in, in Khartoum. The agreement of Juba was that they should be dissolved in the army as well, the same like the rabbit support forces. Uh, my also, I'm also drawing attention to these four forces. Uh, we don't know. I hope they will not be drawn into this conflict, because if that have been, I think we will have a very, very escalating environment. Because right so now, are, right are, now, it's not a civil war. Right now, it's an, it's it's a fight yes. between uh, two uh, rival security forces. But uh, the big worry, we have to learn lessons from what the rabbit support forces have done. Uh, and to remind ourselves, as they have been doing this for the last six days, we already have other four forces in Khartoum. Uh, they're supposed to have been dissolved in the army. They are there. So we really need to act. The international community should act very quickly to control this war, to stop it, and to find a solution. All right, do you, see, you, say, you say international community, picking up on what Robert Parsons said, who in the international community? The people who are interested have been very keen on Sudan, including United States, my country here, United Kingdom, the United Nations, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, Egypt, all these countries have been involved in mediating between the two generals. So they need to step up. Ethiopia, these countries are also have big stake in Sudan. But as I always been arguing on the last few days, we need to change the dialogue, the, the language with these, with these two military forces. It has to change. Because now we're talking about people, Sudanese civilians, simply losing their life in their homes. We cannot just be reminding these two generals they have to stop the war. This fighting needs to stop as soon as possible. And the United Nations should change the way we, the, the, the Sudanese people are really have lost hope in the international community, not doing enough for their own so, safety now. So what are you suggesting, that they, they sanction uh, General Al-Buran and uh, Mehmeti? I suggest they give them a clear, clear, clear statements of warning. This is not acceptable. This war has to stop immediately. And whatever in their capacity to do, they have to do it. We have the, all these countries are heavily involved. You just mentioned in your report before I, uh, I started speaking, two uh, military uh, airplanes from Germany went to all the way to Khartoum to try to big their uh, people. Even the, the British government trying to have a number for people to try to evacuate them. How are you going to even evacuate, but even to supply the country with, med with medicines, uh, humanitarian aid, how are you going to do that if the airport is under fire? So I think the situation is very serious because now we simply we cannot even supply or send any medication, food, anything to this country, Sudan, because the airport is under siege. If, if I could just put a question to you, I, I absolutely agree with you that it's important. In fact, probably the only way that this conflict can be brought under control is by outside influence being brought to bear. The, pro the problem for me, though, is that I can't see you know, what influence uh, these foreign powers have at the moment inside Sudan. What sanction, in other words, can they bring to bear against either one force or the other, which will be sufficient to make them stop doing what they're doing at the moment? We, the general public and the Sudanese people, in many times I have been in discussion with many people in Sudan, even with political parties, we really don't know what is going behind the scene between these two military forces, the military and the rabbit forces, over the last possibly one and a half year. They saw things happening. We hear about a special envoy from the UK is traveling to meet General Burhan. The European Union is meeting General Burhan, meeting Hameti, uh, the United Nations, and so on. We don't know exactly what is going happening behind the scene. And to add more evidence to this, when the special, uh, the, the, the UN 
reporting and briefing to the Security Council. Volker is keep giving briefing to the Security Council, telling them until recently, two weeks ago, the situation is very close, or these parties are very close to sign the agreement where the, the, the civilian will take power and blah, blah, blah. It tends to be that was just a rosy thing. It was, in my opinion, it was a misleading assessment by the UN office in Khartoum, giving to the United Nations Security Council. So there's lots of things behind the scene we don't know. But clearly, the European Union, the UK, the US, the UN, they do have influence on these two uh, military forces, and they want to exercise it. What is it exactly? We've been kept in the dark. We don't know exactly what is the politics behind the scene. But let's say, let's say, just for the sake of argument, that they are unable to bring any pressure to bear sufficient to stop these two men from pursuing their, their conflict. What then? Is Sudan set on the course for civil war? Unfortunately, we start to see that. We start to see people looting each other. We start to see people fleeing the country. And we start to see uh, things happening in Darfur, in uh, Niala, in other parts of, of Sudan, which is still not that civil war, but it could easily be uh, triggered to, to be. Because don't forget, the rapid support forces uh, started in Western Sudan, in Darfur, and it's a militia. It used to be scattered on that area. It's more of a uh, civilian war tactic they use. We don't know. We really don't know. Because even General Burhan yesterday in Al Jazeera TV uh, interview, he was referring to many checkpoints in Khartoum by the rapid uh, support forces. And the problem, because they are within the civilian, is very difficult to eradicate them. He is spoken about many uh, weak points. Now the army is struggling with, and primarily because of the nature of the conflict and the, 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 they want to protect the civilian. So we really don't want to end up in a civil war. The problem is the area around us, in Libya, in Iraq, in Yemen, and all these places, there is evidence of civil war as a result of this, uh, of similar incidents like this. So I think the Sudanese political parties, they need to raise up their game at this particular moment and unite around uh, one call, which can be a one single voice to the United Nations, to the European Union, to the UK, to America, to the Arab neighboring countries, which is that they have to be seen as one uni unified, uh, unified body at the moment or what is one of the reasons why we are here now, because the political parties who were supposed to uh, have the transition, uh, to support the transition to civilian transition government, they were not unified. They were in conflict. They were fighting each other. That what gave ammunition to the rebel support forces and the military to stay on and on and to treat them regardless of uh, the international, uh, if you like, uh, sanctions. And they can continue to argue that with the military, we will go back to our barracks and we will give you guys to run the country with the civilian government. But you are not a unified front. And they start to argue that these people are not trusted with running the government. So we do have our internal affairs and we have to raise the responsibility as the Sudanese people to take care of our own country. Otherwise, the UN or UK or US, whatever it is, they are not going to solve our problems. Problem has to be solved uh, from the inside first. Uh, Alam yes. Ahmed, many thanks for joining us uh, from London. I want to thank as well uh, Robert Parsons uh, for, for being uh, with us.